The Story of Civilization, Volume 1, Our Oriental Heritage, Part 1, by Will Durant, concluded. Sher Shah, though capable of slaughter in the best Islamic style, rebuilt Delhi in fine architectural taste and established governmental reforms that prepared for the enlightened rule of Akbar. Two minor shahs held the power for a decade. Then Humayun, after twelve years of hardship and wandering, organized a force in Persia, re-entered India, and recaptured the throne. Eight months later, Humayun fell from the terrace of his library and died. During his exile and poverty, his wife had borne him a son whom he had piously called Muhammad, but whom India was to call Akbar, that is, very great. No effort was spared to make him great. Even his ancestry had taken every precaution, for in his veins ran the blood of Babur, Timur, and Genghis Khan. Tutors were supplied him in abundance, but he rejected them and refused to learn how to read. Instead, he educated himself for kingship by incessant and dangerous sport. He became a perfect horseman, played polo royally, and knew the art of controlling the most ferocious elephants. He was always ready to set out on a lion or tiger hunt, to undergo any fatigue, and to face all dangers in the first person. Like a good Turk, he had no effeminate distaste for human blood. When at the age of fourteen he was invited to win the title of Ghazi, slayer of the infidel, by killing a Hindu prisoner, he cut off the man's head at once with one stroke of his scimitar. These were the barbarous beginnings of a man destined to become one of the wisest, most humane, and most cultured of all the kings known to history. At the age of eighteen he took over from the regent the full direction of affairs. His dominion then extended over an eighth of India, a belt of territory some three hundred miles broad, running from the northwest frontier at Multan to Benares in the east. He set out with the zeal and veracity of his grandfather to extend these borders and by a series of ruthless wars he made himself ruler of all Hindustan except for the little Rajput kingdom of Mewar. Returning to Delhi, he put aside his armor and devoted himself to reorganizing the administration of his realm. His power was absolute, and all important offices, even in distant provinces, were filled by his appointment. His principal aides were four. A prime minister, or vakir, a finance minister, sometimes called vizier, sometimes diwan, a master of the court, or bakshi, and a primate, or sadr, who was head of the Mohammedan religion in India. As his rule acquired tradition and prestige, he depended less and less upon military power, and contended himself with a standing army of some twenty-five thousand men. In time of war this modest force was augmented with troops recruited from the provincial military governors, a precarious arrangement which had something to do with the fall of the Mughal Empire under Aurangzeb. Bribery and embezzlement throve among these governors and their subordinates, so that much of Akbar's time was spent in checking corruption. He regulated with strict economy the expenses of his court and household, fixing the prices of food and materials bought for them, and the wages of labor engaged by the state. When he died, he left the equivalent of a billion dollars in the treasury, and his empire was the most powerful on earth. Both law and taxation were severe, but far less than before. From one-sixth to one-third of the gross produce of the soil was taken from the peasants, amounting to some one hundred million dollars a year in land tax. The emperor was legislator, executive, and judge. As supreme court, he spent many hours in giving audience to important litigants. His law forbade child marriage and compulsory sati, sanctioned the remarriage of widows, abolished the slavery of captives and the slaughter of animals for sacrifice, gave freedom to all religions, opened career to every talent of whatever creed or race, and removed the head tax that the Afghan rulers had placed upon all Hindus unconverted to Islam. At the beginning of his reign the law included such punishments as mutilation. At the end it was probably the most enlightened code of any sixteenth-century government. Every state begins with violence, and, if it becomes secure, mellows into liberty. But the strength of a ruler is often the weakness of his government. The system depended so much upon Akbar's superior qualities of mind and character that obviously it would threaten to disintegrate at his death. He had, of course, most of the virtues, since he engaged most of the historians. He was the best athlete, the best horseman, the best swordsman, one of the greatest architects, and by all odds the handsomest man in the kingdom. Actually, he had long arms, bow legs, narrow mongoloid eyes, a head drooping leftward, and a wart on his nose. He made himself presentable by neatness, dignity, serenity, and brilliant eyes that could sparkle, says a contemporary, like the sea in sunshine, or flare up in a way to make the offender tremble with terror, like Vandamme before Napoleon. 
He dressed simply in brocaded cap, blouse, and trousers, jewels, and bare feet. He cared little for meat and gave it up almost entirely in his later years, saying that it is not right that a man should make his stomach the grave of animals. Nevertheless, he was strong in body and will, excelled in many active sports, and thought nothing of walking thirty-six miles in a day. He liked polo so much that he invented a luminous ball in order that the game might be played at night. He inherited the violent impulses of his family, and in his youth, like his Christian contemporaries, he was capable of solving problems by assassination. Gradually he learned, in Woodrow Wilson's phrase, to sit upon his own volcano. He rose far above his time in that spirit of fair play which does not always distinguish Oriental rulers. His clemency, says Firishta, was without bounds. This virtue he often carried beyond the line of prudence. He was generous, expending vast sums in alms. He was affable to all, but especially to the lowly. Their little offerings, says a Jesuit missionary, he used to accept with such a pleased look, handling them and putting them in his bosom, as he did not do with the most lavish gifts of the nobles. One of his contemporaries described him as an epileptic. Many said that melancholy possessed him to a morbid degree. Perhaps to put a brighter color on reality, he drank liquor and took opium in moderation. His father and his children had similar habits, without similar self-control. He had a harem suitable to the size of his empire. One gossip tells us that the king hath in Agra and Fatpur Sikri, as they do credibly report, one thousand elephants, thirty thousand horses, fourteen hundred tame deer, eight hundred concubines. But he does not seem to have had sensual ambitions or tastes. He married widely, but politically. He pleased the Rajput princes by espousing their daughters, and thereby bound them to the support of his throne, and from that time the Mughal dynasty was half native in blood. A Rajput became his leading general, and a Raja rose to be his greatest minister. His dream was a united India. His mind was not quite as realistic and coldly accurate as Caesar's or Napoleon's. He had a passion for metaphysics and might, if deposed, have become a mystic recluse. He thought constantly and was forever making inventions and suggesting improvements. Like Harun al-Rashid, he took nocturnal rambles in disguise and came back bursting with reforms. In the midst of his complex activity, he made time to collect a great library, composed entirely of manuscripts beautifully written and engraved by those skillful penmen whom he esteemed as artists fully equal to the painters and architects that adorned his reign. He despised print as a mechanical and impersonal thing, and soon disposed of the choice specimens of European typography presented to him by his Jesuit friends. The volumes in his library numbered only twenty-four thousand, but they were valued at three million five hundred thousand dollars by those who thought that such hordes of the spirit could be estimated in material terms. He patronized poets without stint, and loved one of them, the Hindu Birbal, so much that he made him a court favorite, and finally a general whereupon Birbal made a mess of a campaign and was slaughtered in no lyric flight. Akbar had his literary aids render into Persian, which was the language of his court, the masterpieces of Hindu literature, history, and science, and himself supervised the translation of the interminable Mahabharata. Every art flourished under his patronage and stimulation. Hindu music and poetry had now one of their greatest periods, and painting, both Persian and Hindu, reached its second zenith through his encouragement. At Agra, he directed the building of the famous fort, and within its walls erected, by proxy, five hundred buildings that his contemporaries considered to be among the most beautiful in the world. They were torn down by the impetuous Shah Jahan, and can be judged only by such remnants of Akbar's architecture as the tomb of Humayun at Delhi, and the remains at Fatpur Sikri, where the mausoleum of Akbar's beloved friend, the ascetic Sheikh Salim Chisti, is among the fairest structures in India. Deeper than these interests was his penchant for speculation. This well-nigh omnipotent emperor secretly yearned to be a philosopher, much as philosophers long to be emperors, and cannot comprehend the stupidity of providence in withholding from them their rightful thrones. After conquering the world, Akbar was unhappy because he could not understand it. Although, he said, I am the master of so vast a kingdom, and all the appliances of government are at my hand, yet since true greatness consists in doing the will of God, my mind is not at ease in this diversity of sects and creeds, and apart from this outward pomp of circumstance, with what satisfaction in this despondency can I undertake the sway of empire? I await the coming of some discreet man of principle who will resolve the difficulties of my conscience. Discourses in philosophy have such a charm for me that they distract me from all else, and I forcibly restrain myself from listening to them lest the necessary duties of the hour should be neglected. 
Crowds of learned men from all nations, says Badaoni, and sages of various religions and sects came to the court and were honored with private conversations. After inquiries and investigations, which were their only business and occupation day and night, they would talk about profound points of science, the subtleties of revelation, the curiosities of history, and the wonders of nature. The superiority of man, said Akbar, rests in the jewel of reason. As became a philosopher, he was profoundly interested in religion. His careful reading of the Mahabharata and his intimacy with Hindu poets and sages lured him into the study of Indian faiths. For a time, at least, he accepted the theory of transmigration and scandalized his Muslim followers by appearing in public with Hindu religious marks on his forehead. He had a flair for humoring all the creeds. He pleased the Zoroastrians by wearing their sacred shirt and girdle under his clothes and allowed the Jains to persuade him to abandon hunting and to prohibit on certain days the killing of animals. When he learned of the new religion called Christianity, which had come into India with the Portuguese occupation of Goa, he dispatched a message to the Paulist missionaries there, inviting them to send two of their learned men to him. Later some Jesuits came to Delhi and so interested him in Christ that he ordered his scribes to translate the New Testament. He gave the Jesuits full freedom to make converts and allowed them to bring up one of his sons. While Catholics were murdering Protestants in France, and Protestants under Elizabeth were murdering Catholics in England, and the Inquisition was killing and robbing Jews in Spain, and Bruno was being burned at the stake in Italy, Akbar invited the representatives of all the religions in his empire to a conference, pledged them to peace, issued edicts of toleration for every cult and creed, and as evidence of his own neutrality, married wives from the Brahmin, Buddhist, and Mohammedan faiths. His greatest pleasure, after the fires of youth had cooled, was in the free discussion of religious beliefs. He had quite discarded the dogmas of Islam to such an extent that his Muslim subjects fretted under his impartial rule. This king, St. Francis Xavier reported with some exaggeration, has destroyed the false sect of Mohammed and wholly discredited it. In this city there is neither a mosque nor a Koran, the book of their law, and the mosques that were there have been made stables for horses and storehouses. The king took no stock in revelations and would accept nothing that could not justify itself with science and philosophy. It was not unusual for him to gather friends and prelates of various sects together and discuss religion with them from Thursday evening to Friday noon. When the Moslem mullahs and the Christian priests quarreled, he reproved them both, saying that God should be worshipped through the intellect and not by a blind adherence to supposed revelations. Each person, he said, in the spirit and perhaps through the influence of the Upanishads and Kabir, According to his condition gives the supreme being a name, but in reality to name the unknowable is vain. Certain Moslems suggested an ordeal by fire as a test of Christianity versus Islam. A mullah holding the Koran and a priest holding one of the Gospels were to enter a fire, and he who should come out unhurt would be adjudged the teacher of truth. Akbar, who did not like the mullah who was proposed for this experiment, warmly seconded the suggestion, but the Jesuit rejected it as blasphemous and impious, not to say dangerous. Gradually, the rival groups of theologians shunned these conferences and left them to Akbar and his rationalist intimates. Harassed by the religious divisions in his kingdom and disturbed by the thought that they might disrupt it after his death, Akbar finally decided to promulgate a new religion, containing in simple form the essentials of the warring faiths. The Jesuit missionary Bartoli records the matter thus. He summoned a general council and invited to it all the masters of learning and the military commandants of the cities round about, excluding only Father Ridolfo, whom it was vain to expect to be other than hostile to his sacrilegious purpose. When he had them all assembled in front of him, he spoke in a spirit of astute and knavish policy, saying, For an empire ruled by one head it was a bad thing to have the members divided among themselves and at variance one with the other, whence it came about that there are as many factions as religions. We ought, therefore, to bring them all into one, but in such fashion that they should be both one and all, with the great advantage of not losing what is good in any one religion, while gaining whatever is better in another. In that way, honor would be rendered to God, peace would be given to the people, and security to the empire. The council, perforce consenting, he issued a decree proclaiming himself the infallible head of the church. This was the chief contribution of Christianity to the new religion. The creed was a pantheistic monotheism in the best Hindu tradition, with a spark of sun and fire worship from the Zoroastrians and a semi jain recommendation to abstain from meat. The slaughter of cows was made a capital offense. Nothing could have pleased the Hindus more or the Moslems less. 
A later edict made vegetarianism compulsory on the entire population for at least a hundred days in the year, and in further consideration of native ideas, garlic and onions were prohibited. The building of mosques, the fast of Ramadan, the pilgrimage to Mecca, and other Mohammedan customs were banned. Many Muslims who resisted the edicts were exiled. In the center of the peace court at Fatpur Sikri, a temple of united religion was built, and still stands there, as a symbol of the emperor's fond hope that now all the inhabitants of India might be brothers, worshipping the same god. As a religion, the Din Ilahi never succeeded. Akbar found tradition too strong for his infallibility. A few thousand rallied to the new cult, largely as a means of securing official favor. The vast majority adhered to their inherited gods. Politically, the stroke had some beneficent results. The abolition of the head tax and the pilgrim tax on the Hindus, the freedom granted to all religions, the weakening of racial and religious fanaticism, dogmatism, and division far outweighed the egotism and excesses of Akbar's novel revelation. And it won him such loyalty from even the Hindus, who did not accept his creed, that his prime purpose, political unity, was largely achieved. With his own fellow Muslims, however, the Din Ilahi was a source of bitter resentment, leading at one time to open revolt, and stirring Prince Jehangir into treacherous machinations against his father. The prince complained that Akbar had reigned forty years, and had so strong a constitution that there was no prospect of his early death. Jehangir organized an army of thirty thousand horsemen, killed Abu el Fazl, the king's court historian and dearest friend, and proclaimed himself emperor. Akbar persuaded the youth to submit, and forgave him after a day. But the disloyalty of his son, added to the death of his mother and his friend, broke his spirit, and left him an easy prey for the great enemy. In his last days his children ignored him, and gave their energies to quarreling for his throne. Only a few intimates were with him when he died, presumably of dysentery, perhaps of poisoning by Jehangir. Mullahs came to his deathbed to reconvert him to Islam, but they failed. The king passed away without the benefit of the prayers of any church or sect. No crowd followed his simple funeral, and the sons and courtiers who had worn mourning for the event discarded it the same evening, and rejoiced that they had inherited his kingdom. It was a bitter death for the justest and wisest ruler that Asia has ever known. 8. The Decline of the Mughals The children of great men, Jehangir, Shah Jahan, his magnificence, his fall, Aurangzeb, his fanaticism, his death, the coming of the British. The children who had waited so impatiently for his death found it difficult to hold together the empire that had been created by his genius. Why is it that great men so often have mediocrities for their offspring? Is it because the gamble of the genes that produced them, the commingling of ancestral traits and biological possibilities, was but a chance? and could not be expected to recur? Or is it because the genius exhausts in thought and toil the force that might have gone to parentage and leaves only his diluted blood to his heirs? Or is it that children decay under ease and early good fortune deprives them of the stimulus to ambition and growth? Jehangir was not so much a mediocrity as an able degenerate. Born of a Turkish father and a Hindu princess, he enjoyed all the opportunities of an heir apparent, indulged himself in alcohol and lechery, and gave full vent to that sadistic joy and cruelty which had been a recessive character in Babur, Humayun, and Akbar, but had always lurked in the Tatar blood. He took delight in seeing men flayed alive, impaled, or torn to pieces by elephants. In his memoirs he tells how, because their careless entrance upon the scene startled his quarry in a hunt, he had a groom killed, and the groom's servants hamstrung, that is, crippled for life by severing the tendons behind the knees. Having attended to this, he says, I continued hunting. When his son Kusru conspired against him, he had seven hundred supporters of the rebel impaled in a line along the streets of Lahore, and he remarks with pleasure on the length of time it took these men to die. His sexual life was attended to by a harem of six thousand women, and graced by his later attachment to his favorite wife, Nur Jahan, whom he acquired by murdering her husband. His administration of justice was impartial as well as severe, but the extravagance of his expenditures laid a heavy burden upon a nation which had become the most prosperous on the globe through the wise leadership of Akbar and many years of peace. Toward the end of his reign, Jehangir took more and more to his cups and neglected the tasks of government. Inevitably, conspiracies arose to replace him. Already in 1622 his son Jahan had tried to seize the throne. When Jehangir died, Jahan hurried up from the Dakan, where he had been hiding, 
proclaimed himself emperor and murdered all his brothers to ensure his peace of mind. His father passed on to him his habits of extravagance, intemperance, and cruelty. The expenses of Jahan's court and the high salaries of his innumerable officials absorbed more and more of the revenue produced by the thriving industry and commerce of the people. The religious tolerance of Akbar and the indifference of Jahangir were replaced by a return to the Moslem faith, the persecution of Christians, and the ruthless and wholesale destruction of Hindu shrines. Shah Jahan redeemed himself in some measure by his generosity to his friends and the poor, his artistic taste and passion in adorning India with the fairest architecture that it had ever seen, and his devotion to his wife, Muntaz Mahal, ornament of the palace. He had married her in his twenty-first year, when he had already had two children by an earlier consort. Muntaz gave her tireless husband fourteen children in eighteen years, and died at the age of thirty-nine in bringing forth the last. Shah Jahan built the immaculate Taj Mahal as a monument to her memory and her fertility, and relapsed into a scandalous licentiousness. The most beautiful of all the world's tombs was but one of a hundred masterpieces that Jahan erected, chiefly at Agra, and in that new Delhi which grew up under his planning. The costliness of these palaces, the luxuriousness of the court, the extravagant jewelry of the peacock throne, would suggest a rate of taxation ruinous to India. Nevertheless, though one of the worst famines in India's history occurred in Shah Jahan's reign, his thirty years of government marked the zenith of India's prosperity and prestige. The lordly Shah was a capable ruler, and though he wasted many lives in foreign war, he gave his own land a full generation of peace. As a great British administrator of Bombay, Mount Stuart Elphinstone wrote, Those who look on India in its present state may be inclined to suspect the native writers of exaggerating its former prosperity. But the deserted cities, ruined palaces, and choked-up aqueducts which we still see, with the great reservoirs and embankments in the midst of jungles, and the decayed causeways, wells, and caravanserais of the royal roads, concur with the evidence of contemporary travellers in convincing us that those historians had good grounds for their commendation. Jahan had begun his reign by killing his brothers, but he had neglected to kill his sons, one of whom was destined to overthrow him. In 1657, the ablest of these, Aurangzeb, led an insurrection from the Deccan. The Shah, like David, gave instructions to his generals to defeat the rebel army, but to spare, if possible, the life of his son. Aurangzeb overcame all the forces sent against him, captured his father, and imprisoned him in the fort of Agra. For nine bitter years the deposed king lingered there, never visited by his son, attended only by his faithful daughter Jahanara, and spending his days looking from the jasmine tower of his prison across to Jumna, where his once beloved Muntaz lay in her jeweled tomb. The son who so ruthlessly deposed him was one of the greatest saints in the history of Islam, and perhaps the most nearly unique of the Mughal emperors. The mullahs who had educated him and so imbued him with religion that at one time the young prince had thought of renouncing the empire and the world and becoming a religious recluse. Throughout his life, despite his despotism, his subtle diplomacy and a conception of morals as applying only to his own sect, he remained a pious Muslim, reading prayers at great length, memorizing the entire Koran, and warring against infidelity. He spent hours in devotion and days in fasts. For the most part he practiced his religion as earnestly as he professed it. It is true that in politics he was cold and calculating, capable of lying cleverly for his country and his god. But he was the least cruel of the moguls, and the mildest. Slaughter abated in his reign, and he made hardly any use of punishment in dealing with crime. He was consistently humble in deportment, patient under provocation, and resigned in misfortune. He abstained scrupulously from all food, drink, or luxury forbidden by his faith. Though skilled in music, he abandoned it as a sensual pleasure, and apparently he carried out his resolve to spend nothing upon himself save what he had been able to earn by the labor of his hands. He was a St. Augustine on the throne. Shah Jahan had given half his revenues to the promotion of architecture and the other arts. Aurangzeb cared nothing for art, destroyed its heathen monuments with coarse bigotry, and fought, through a reign of half a century, to eradicate from India almost all religions but his own. He issued orders to the provincial governors and to his other subordinates to raise to the ground all the temples of either Hindus or Christians, to smash every idol, and to close every Hindu school. In one year, 1679 to 1680, sixty-six temples were broken to pieces in Amber alone, sixty-three at Chittor, one hundred and twenty-three at Udaipur. And over the site of a Benares temple, especially sacred to the Hindus, he built, in deliberate insult, a Mohammedan mosque. He forbade all public worship of the Hindu faiths, 
and laid upon every unconverted Hindu a heavy capitation tax. As a result of his fanaticism, thousands of the temples which had represented or housed the art of India through a millennium were laid in ruins. We can never know, from looking at India today, what grandeur and beauty she once possessed. Aurangzeb converted a handful of timid Hindus to Islam, but he wrecked his dynasty and his country. A few Muslims worshipped him as a saint, but the mute and terrorized millions of India looked upon him as a monster, fled from his tax gatherers, and prayed for his death. During his reign, the Mughal Empire in India reached its height, extending into the Deccan, but it was a power that had no foundation in the affection of the people, and was doomed to fall at the first hostile and vigorous touch. The emperor himself, in his last years, began to realize that by the very narrowness of his piety he had destroyed the heritage of his fathers. His deathbed letters are pitiful documents. I know not who I am, where I shall go, or what will happen to this sinner full of sins. My years have gone by profitless. God has been in my heart, yet my darkened eyes have not recognized his light. There is no hope for me in the future. The fever is gone, but only the skin is left. I have greatly sinned, and know not what torments await me. May the peace of God be upon you. He left instructions that his funeral should be ascetically simple, and that no money should be spent on his shroud except the four rupees that he had made by sewing caps. The top of his coffin was to be covered with a plain piece of canvas. To the poor he left three hundred rupees earned by copying the Koran. He died at the age of eighty-nine, having long outstayed his welcome on the earth. Within seventeen years of his death his empire was broken into fragments. The support of the people, so wisely won by Akbar, had been forfeited by the cruelty of Jahangir, the wastefulness of Jahan, and the intolerance of Aurangzeb. The Muslim minority, already enervated by India's heat, had lost the military ardor and physical vigor of their prime, and no fresh recruits were coming from the north to buttress their declining power. Meanwhile, far away in the west, a little island had sent its traders to cull the riches of India. Soon it would send its guns, and take over this immense empire in which Hindu and Moslem had joined to build one of the great civilizations of history. This concludes the reading of The Story of Civilization, Volume 1, Our Oriental Heritage, Part 1, by Will Durant. Part 2 continues the story and is available through the books on tape service. This book was read by Alexander Adams.